so originally plays were performed in London either in large indoor spaces, so um, guild halls or travelling around the country, town halls, uh, in court, banqueting halls, in old monasteries. So one place was a large indoor space and you put a stage in it. Another place where you would perform would be a large outdoor space. Um, these were often things like inn yards because an inn yard uh, is enclosed. Um, and what you could then do is um, you could charge people at the entrance to the inn yard itself. You can put a stage at one end and people in the inn, inns are often square, sort of quadrangle. Uh, um, and you can have people all around the outside looking at the play going on on the stage. So inn yards, um, uh, large indoor spaces, and also sometimes there were f um, freestanding scaffolds were built up and that then you could simply have a field and put a scaffold up and perform in that. And stages go on being called scaffolds for many years, I think because of that. Um, so that's what happens. And then ultimately, London gets large enough just about to sustain a permanent theatre. Um, up until a certain point, it has been too small actually to have year-round theatre of any kind. And the first professional uh, fixed theatre we know of is called the Red Lion. And the Red Lion was built in 1567. But that said, it may have been somewhere between temporary and permanent. It was certainly cheap. It cost 15, 20 pounds to build. Um, it didn't have proper foundations. And we only know of one play that was ever put on there, the story of Samson. So although it's often said to be the first permanent theater, it wasn't much of one. Um, and it didn't last seemingly longer than a year. So the first real, real professional theaters were in the 1570s. Um, and in 1576, a round outdoor theater called The Theater was built. And maybe at that same time, another round outdoor theatre called um, Newington Butts was built, and those seem to have been the first theatres. Well, a certain amount of it is guesswork. Um, but uh, let me tell you who built the theatre. So there was um, a man who was originally a joiner and who then became an actor, and he was called James Burbage. And James Burbage um, decided, or it seems to have been his decision, to build a round outdoor theatre. Um, so he seems to have, he seems to have arranged for it to be built. Um, the carpentry appears to have been done uh, partly by his brother Robert, and the money was partly provided by his brother-in-law. Um, so it was a, a family concern, though a contentious one. Um, he ended up cheating his brother-in-law out of a certain amount of money. Um, but it appears to have been his idea to build this round outdoor theatre, and he therefore, in some sense, created professional theatre and what it looked like for early modern London. James Burbage was an actor. So I think, for one thing, he was an entrepreneur with an actor's mind, and he must have noticed that... Um, that London was large enough to sustain a professional theatre, or he must have guessed that it was. Um, also, laws in London had become much stricter about performing in inns, and basically players were being sent out of London. So um, he must have thought, well, now is the time then to set up uh, a big permanent theatre just outside the walled city of London, but hovering near a gate, and the theatre is built in, in Shoreditch um, and it's just outside Bishopsgate. And so I think, that, I think it's, it's that, a practical common sense that made him do that. But there are other questions about his theatre. Um, I think one is, why is it that extraordinary round shape? Um, no other buildings in London seem to have had that shape, except perhaps uh, places for bear and animal baiting. So for one thing, it has an animal baiting look. But for another thing, he does call that place the theatre. And the usual name for a playing space is Playhouse. So in calling it the theatre, he must in some way be looking to uh, classical amphitheatres. And he must be being sort of pretentious 
um, and appealing to people's classical knowledge, whilst also in practical terms, uh, appealing to low culture, to people who like animal baiting. And I think there's one other reason maybe why it has that round shape. Um, and that is that um, entertainment often travelled around in fairgrounds. And in fairgrounds, you would stop and you would put up tents and performances would happen inside tents. And so also that round shape is reminiscent of a tent. So it manages to be high culture and low culture. And I think that's one reason why he'll have gone for it. And I also think that if you've got a unique, surprising shape, that advertises and promotes itself more than a square building might. As ever with theatre history, we have to get our knowledge from all kinds of different things. What we have are a series of court cases, disputes uh, between the Burbages and with James Burbage and his extended family for money about the theatre. So that tells us a certain amount of practical things about who built it, who financed it, and so forth. We also have a, a very few maps and we have a picture we once thought was the theatre, but now we think it's the curtain. But maybe the other tiny theatre in the background is the other one. These, these theatres were very close. So we've got pictures, we've got court cases, we've got sermons fulminating against the theatre. Um, now, of course, these are all, always or nearly always negative. But when they say it's a gorgeous playing place, but, you know, it's gorgeous, but it's not a church. It's, it's for something terrible. But they, so these also give us a sense of its look, its atmosphere. Um, there are very, very occasional um, uh, um, references in letters. Um, there are plays, plays that were put on in those spaces. Those tell us something about the spaces. And then there's modern archaeology and the things we've discovered. And so when you're trying to work out about something like the theatre, you're, you're picking an image, a sentence, um, a piece of earth and you're putting it all together and trying to create a picture so we're always slightly in danger therefore of coming up with our own narratives but nevertheless there are some certain things um its shape its dates um its uh its association with prostitution its uh gaudiness that are well attested to The curtain was built one year after the theatre and it was built in the same vicinity, in the Hollywell vicinity, which had been an old monastery. Um, and so you might think, well, it was built to sort of rival the curtain, at uh, the theatre. Sorry, you might think that the curtain was built to rival the theatre. Um, if it was, it was not at all successful. It always seems to have been the poorer, younger sister. But oddly, they got linked in some way that we can't quite work out. Uh, the curtain was built by a man called uh, Landman. But in 1585, he made an arrangement with James Burbage and Brain, the brother-in-law, that the curtain and theatre would share profits and halve them between them. And why they did that is quite unclear, particularly as these are, these are two concerns that, as I say, one would have thought would be rivals. But that said, maybe they'd worked out that it was better actually to share audience and profits. Um, and certainly, when the theatre was closed, the company that had been using the theatre then moved into the curtain until they could build, ultimately, the globe. Up until 1594, we don't know that much. Um, so what seems to have happened when the theatre was originally built is that it was a fixed structure but it didn't necessarily have a fixed company. Um, that's because um, London was, so, was too small to sustain a play run and didn't yet have companies, um, I think, uh, substantial enough to put on many, many, many plays. So what seems to have happened, though it's a little difficult to tell, but from the snapshots we have, we seem to have snapshots of different companies performing uh, in that space. So it's a fixed space with an unfixed company. Uh, things change in 1594 when what appears to happen is that what has been called a duopoly is built up. That is to say that only two companies are formally allowed, one in the theatre and one in the rows. Um, in the theatre you have the Lord Chamberlain's men for whom Shakespeare is writing 
and James Burbage's son, Richard Burbage, who's the great actor of the time, he is acting there. And then the rival company at the Rose, the rival company is the Admiral's Men. Uh, Edward Allen is their great actor. The story is a bit hazy, but at a certain point, those theatres uh, start to have fixed companies. And from that point, and maybe earlier, as I say, it's hard to tell, but at least from that point, um, plays will have been written for that space. And obviously, people are very interested in Shakespeare in this respect. And one assumes that Shakespeare's plays from 1594, which include plays like Midsummer Night's Dream and Romeo and Juliet, Richard II, one assumes that these plays were written for the theatre. So the process of putting on a play appears to have been something like this. Uh, the author would read the play to a selection of actors, not all the actors, but the actors who have shares in the theatrical company, because they are financially responsible for the success of the play. So the author reads the play to the sharers, and the sharers decide whether they want that play or not, and if they want any changes made to it. And assuming they like it and they want it, um, the play is then divided, written out, into actors' parts for each actor. An actor's part is all the lines that actor is going to say with a cue of the last one or two or three words before each of his speeches. I say his because all actors are male at that time. So each actor would then get their separate actor's part and they would take that physical part home with them to learn and they would learn it off by heart. But they would learn it off by heart away from the body of the play or from the other actors. And that was the main rehearsal. Um, what then seems to have happened is that there was no director, but there was a prompter. And the prompter was responsible for practical business of staging. And the prompter would organise generally one collective rehearsal in which he could see that all the actors knew their lines and in which collective things could be practised, like sword fights and songs and dances. And then all being well, um, the play would then go into production. If the rehearsal revealed that the play was in an awful state, it would have another rehearsal, but no one wanted lots of rehearsals as they were unpaid, whereas performance was paid. So that is how a play was put on. The profession of acting was regarded with a weird mixture, or, or maybe the same kind of mixture we have now of praise and disdain combined. So actors, for instance, the actors at the theatre um, once they were the Lord Chamberlain's men, they had the patronage of the Lord Chamberlain and they performed at court at Christmas time and for other celebrations. So in that way, they, are, they belong to and socialise with the highest dignitaries. At the same time, it was not a profession that had a guild. Um, so that actually, if you wanted the protection of a guild, you would tend to keep your old guild membership. So... When one looks up a lot of actors, one often finds that they are technically joiners or goldsmiths or other things, because acting didn't have a guild. That made it an insecure profession. Um, also, if you were reliant on payment uh, for seeing a performance, then whenever plague closes the theatres, uh, you are in danger of having no livelihood. So you are rich and poor, you're despised and admired, you hang about at court, but um, it's just a very, very weird profession in that way. And Shakespeare himself has very mixed feelings about it um, and writes a sonnet in which he says that, like the dyer's hand, he's been dyed, coloured, sort of corrupted by his trade, probably playwriting, but perhaps acting. So Blackfriars was a monastery in London. Um, it was disbanded by Henry VIII. So then you had in London a large area um, that uh, was known as a liberty. In a liberty, um, that is to say, it is not bound by London laws. So you can have things like playhouses, which you cannot have in the city of London because the mayor doesn't like them. So in the Blackfriars, one bit of the old monastery, the buttery area, was turned into a theatre. This happened in the 1570s, actually. And that was, in fact, the first Blackfriars Theatre. 
uh, in the 1570s at the same time that the theatre in Newington Butts are being built. James Burbage is involved in what is in fact the second Blackfriars Theatre. Um, uh, what happens is the theatre um, that he has so successfully run um, uh, is built on ground that he doesn't own. He owns the theatre, he doesn't own the theatre on which the uh, he doesn't own the field on which the theatre stands. The man who owns the field, Giles Allen, decides he won't rent it anymore. So James Burbage now has a su successful theatrical company and a successful theatre, but doesn't own the ground on which his theatre is built. So he needs another theatre. And he buys for a huge sum of money uh, a bit of the upper freighter, the uh, upper dining room of the old Blackfriars monastery and sets up the second Blackfriars Theatre there. And it is his intention that the company will move from the theatre to that space. But what then happens is um, the residents of Blackfriars uh, complain and make it impossible for him to move in. And that's when the company have to build the globe. They have to build another space. They have to rent out Blackfriars and build the globe. And in the interim period, uh, they move into the curtain. Burbage dies only knowing that the Blackfriars' plans haven't worked out. So he probably dies worried, particularly as he also hasn't paid very much of the Blackfriars' salary, which is left for his poor sons, uh, Richard and Cuthbert, to do. But in fact, the company moved to the curtain, which maybe they partly own. Um, they are unhappy there, it seems. And quite possibly, Henry V is written for the curtain because all its cho choruses say how small and meagre their stage is. Uh, and that's unlikely to be a way in which you triumphantly open a globe theatre. So the company moves into the curtain whilst they start making plans to build the globe theatre. And what they do, they haven't got that much money because they've ploughed so much into Blackfriars. So they reuse the old timbers of the theatre. Um, to do this, they go onto the ground that no longer belongs to them. Uh, in the night, it seems, they take down their theatre, convey it across the Thames and rebuild it as the globe, a, a process that takes about a year. And what we don't know is whether the globe was more or less the theatre simply rebuilt or whether the globe merely used the timbers that made up the theatre and was a spanking new, fantastically different uh, being. What we do know is, as everyone in London will have known that the Globe was the theatre rebuilt, we can think a little bit about the names of those spaces. It is interesting that the theatre becomes the Globe and that Shakespeare starts writing things like all the worlds a stage. We have mixed information about the Rose and the Globe. We were, for instance, very shocked when we dug up the Rose and discovered how small it was. We had assumed it was much larger. And that started to affect the model, the idea we had had that the, the theatre and the curtain were smaller and the Globe and the Rose were larger. But maybe they weren't. If the Globe was the theatre, there's no reason why it should be any larger than the theatre. Though that said, you could always swell it with, with more wood. So we actually don't really know one of the big problems being we don't have real dimensions for the globe. What we have are dimensions for a square theatre, the Fortune, that was built by Peter Street, the same man who built the globe. Um, now, we do have instructions to Peter Street, but the trouble is that many of those instructions are do it the same way that you did it at the globe so that we don't actually have the information about the globe. So the real thing is, we don't really know. We know what people said. People said that you could fit in 3,000 people into the globe, but that may simply be a way of saying a lot of people. It may not have a real meaning. All the early theatres seem to have had some kind of covering above them. Um, although the actors, oh, sorry, although the audience would stand outside in the rain, on the stage, there was often a little bit of covering. And that covering um, was good for a number of reasons. If it rained, the actors could retreat under it and not spoil their lovely clothes. If the sun was too bright, the same thing pertained. Um, 
It also had a better acoustic. Instead of speaking now into the outside world, you're speaking between two spaces, um, and that makes your voice carry better. They all seem to have a bit of a covering, but some of those coverings were big enough to need to be supported by pillars, and others were not. And as we are interested with the rebuilt globe in how pillars destroy sight lines, we are always asking whether those theatres had all had pillars and posts or only some of them did. The globe did. The rose, when we dug it up, seemed not to, which again was another surprise. But we still think it had a bit of a covering or a shade. That covering tends to be called the heavens, partly because it's up and partly because it's painted with stars and signs of the zodiac and heavenly things. And then under the stage, that area tends to be called hell. And that means that actors are always acting in a kind of little metaphorical world. And it is the same metaphorical world. They've probably taken it, in fact, from churches. Churches also have stars and angels up and skulls and bad things down. And it's probably that same world that they have lifted onto the theatre. But that also gives you the sense of all the world's a stage, um, because those little stages really were a little painted world. James Burbage um, was an entrepreneur, an actor, someone who in some sense created professional theatre. He created a good company or seems to have. He, as I say, it's not clear in fact whether Newington Butts or the theatre was the first theatre, but probably it was the theatre given its name. So he may have created professional theatre up to a point, uh, created its round space and also created, um, well, had a son, Richard Burbage, who was then the great actor um, and clearly a huge inspiration to Shakespeare. So in many ways, James Burbage is behind the story or a, a mover and shaker, a worker of what that story is. He's the background to everything um, and not, it seems, a very nice person, but a highly important one for early modern drama. So James Burbage's son, Richard Burbage, was the great Shakespearean, was the great actor of his period, um, but as an epitaph for him, talks about his marvellous Hamlet, his Lear, his Othello, um, that and other things tell us that he was the person who created some of Shakespeare's greatest roles. Um, well, this will be partly because Shakespeare is writing for the company in front of him, but partly it must be that Richard Burbage was inspirational to Shakespeare. They do seem to have been friends, um, that they uh, will things to one another. Um, and uh, there's a nice poem that says that Burbage is a painter, but also an actor. And Shakespeare is a playwright, but also an actor. Um, they shared, they were both actors. Um, uh, they were both, uh, they both had shares in the Globe Theatre. So they seem to have been mutually inspiring to one another.